We continue our third season on oil and gas uh, with an interview at the, at the highest levels of government. As you know, uh, last week we took a look at season two. We had a look back, get a sense of who we had spoken to, all the different perspectives. Many issues came up, issues of transparency, issues of public participation, accountability. And there is no question that as we prepare for forced first oil, there are quite a few challenges. Our guest tonight is, is the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. We have an excellent opportunity to, if you like, uh, hear from the highest levels and get a sense of the direction in which government is taking oil and gas. Your Excellency, John Mahama, thank you for coming. Thank you. John, we, uh, I talked about oil and gas, but I will begin, the, given that I have a, a moment with you, to look at some of the broader issues before we, we look specifically at the issue of oil and gas. Mm. Uh, this administration that you're a vice president of has been in office for slightly under two years, I believe. One and a half. Uh, one and a half years. And, and it is clear that uh, there are a variety of, 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 of challenges. People speak up quite a bit. There's always the famous thing about how the man on the street is, is, not, is not impacted by mm. economic policy. Tell me in your view, uh, how you think the government is faring so far? Well, um, I, I think that in the short period that this government has been in power, considering the challenges that it faced when it took over, mm -hmm. it has done remarkably well. Um, I guess that we have a bit of a problem in telling our story, but um, if you look in the way of economic management, if you look at the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. if you look even in the uh, area of provision of infrastructure in the road sector, some significant mm -hmm work is being done. And so looking at it in the perspective of um, the, the adversity that we, 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 we came into, I think that we've done very well. Um, you're aware that there's been the global crisis that has affected even developed countries. It's not an excuse. Well, I'm, I'm even, even uh, economies of developed countries have not remained unaffected. I just mm. came from the UK mm. and they've passed one of the severest budgets that they've had mm -hmm. in order to rein in expenditure mm -hmm. and cut their deficits. You suggest there's a link between that and here. That's Def what you There's know. definitely a link. Are you sure? Is it significant? I mean, we're on the periphery of the world economy. What is the percentage of trade and so on? I mean, does that really impact us? Of course, that makes it even worse for us because we amount to just a small percentage of mm -hmm. global trade. And so if you control trade, I mean, you have access to income. Mm. And so it makes it even worse when you are affected by this kind of recession. The fact that we didn't see financial institutions collapsing and so on and so forth does not mean that there was no effect on us. Mm. Access to credit became a problem and so on and so on. You could tell from the things that were happening in respect of the economic indicators. We had made arrears and commitments far in excess of our revenues to be able to pay. And so today we have contractors who have been sitting for the last two years or more who have not been paid for uh, jobs and services that were done. Mm. Is it getting better? Is it it's getting, getting better. Would you say the global environment it's getting is better. more conducive? It's getting better. Okay. Let's talk a bit more now, Mr. Mahama, about oil and gas. Okay. Um, and you have already mentioned transparency, public participation, accountability. We have spent, this is maybe the 30th of, well, interview we are doing in looking at oil and gas over the last nine months. There is no question that there are areas of progress, but without doubt, that is one of the areas where I think we run a risk, transparency. Does government truly understand the risk the country runs with an industry like this if it is not transparent? Um, I feel confident. You know, what has happened is... There is uh, no transparency. There is transparency. I mean, let me give you an example. I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you, sir. But let's just talk about petroleum agreements. Mm -hmm. You can't... We don't know where they are. You're not allowed to see them. They, 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 when you inquire, the idea is that you, it's on the website. When you go, it's a generic model agreement. Is there a reason that these agreements with companies must be off limits? They are not off limits. So why do we not see, do we not have access to, for example, the, there's a dispute with Cosmos Energy, this person says that, that person says that. If there was an agreement, you and I would not be in dispute. Yeah, you can have the agreement. There, there's an exploration agreement between uh, government and the partners like Cosmos and others. And we can have access to that. If you go to Parliament, you get them. These agreements are approved by Parliament. 
our constitution says that those agreements must be approved by parliament. And so they are laid before parliament. So is it not strange? If you go to parliament, you should be able to get copies of the agreements. So is it not strange that throughout this whole discussion, nobody has been able to simply pick the agreement, if it is available, to determine what exactly was agreed upon? Well, then I don't think that people are looking in the right place. As far as I know, mm. all exploration agreements have been, have been laid before Parliament, and Parliament has the right to ask any questions yeah. that, that, a, that it wants. What about know? the Right of Information Bill? The Right of Information Bill is still sitting there. Well, Cabinet has done its part. I mean, when we came into office, the Right to Information Bill had been lying somewhere for God knows how many years. And so we quickly took it, you know, went through it, brought it to Cabinet, approved it, and we went to Parliament. And so it's now Parliament's duty to schedule it and um, uh, pass it. But let me say, you know, often people look at the experience of other countries in Africa in respect of oil and gas mm -hmm. and believe that African countries do not have the mechanisms to be able to carry out, you know... But that is justified. That they have not done a good job of it, strictly speaking. Well, you must also look at uh, most of those countries and the timing at which they uh, found oil and gas. I mean, for That's countries like Nigeria in 1960... Transparency or, or, or was not so, fashionable. I mean, <laughs> uh, not at the time, yeah. you understand. And <laughs> let's say that we've all moved on in what we know mm -hmm. and in respect of experience. I mean, Ghana is 52 years old now. If we had discovered oil when we were one year old or two years old, I mean, the institutions of democracy and constitutional governance that we have today probably did not exist at the time. Mm. So I believe that, one, the timing is ripe for this oil and gas discovery. We have the opportunity to learn the best experiences from countries like Norway and others, which we are doing, Trinidad and Tobago with regards to gas and all that. And we have the experience to, uh, the opportunity to learn the worst experiences, you know, from s some of our friends and colleagues. And the good thing is they are willing to share and say that, look, we made these mistakes because I attended one of the oil and gas forums. And there were speakers from other African countries that had experience with handling oil and gas. And they were so candid about it. They said, look, we made these mistakes because at the time we didn't know. Local content and things did not exist. And so even to supply bread to the drill uh, uh, ships and the rigs. Mm -hmm. I mean, some expatriate came and did the supply of bread. Mm -hmm. So it is how you integrate that industry backward into your economy in terms of the services provided and the employment that it generates that will make a successful you know, transformation of your economy. That's the local not. content question. Exactly. But the point I always make is that Ghana has sufficient mechanisms and the right environment to be able to manage an oil and gas industry Why transparently. Why are you so sure? One, you, yeah. because of our constitutional democracy. Two, our judiciary might not be perfect, but I think that an effort is being made to improve it. Three, we have a legislature which is willing to question, you know, like a lot of bills are being questioned and so on and so forth from CNTC, IFC and everything. We have a media that is very alert. Although not always well informed. Although not always well informed, but I think it's, a, ne a, it's a necessary evil. That I think it's, it's a better option than to have a docile, you know, We must discuss that at a different media. time because, because that's a different subject. That's so I think the mechanisms know. exist yes. to have transparency in the oil industry. And with some of the laws that I have seen passed through cabinet and gone to parliament, I think that we're going to have you know, a better a lot of the, the experience. Law, a lot of the laws are still not uh, ready. Well, most of them are. The petroleum uh, bill has gone to Parliament. It's currently, it's been gazetted and mm. it's moving on to Parliament. Mm. Before Parliament rises, two key bills mm. would have been dealt with. That's the petroleum bill and then the uh, oil revenue management bill.